I'm Dean Townsley. Um, I'm a faculty member at the University of Alabama. Um, I spent uh, about four years in Chicago um, at the Flash Center, or adjacent to the Flash Center at the university, um, working on basically developing the energy deposition for supernova simulations. So I'll show a little bit of um, kind of what I do um, in supernova simulations um, in a few minutes during my talk. Um, uh, Anshu asked me to talk today about planning simulations. Um, and so um, I think of this as, so I'm a scientist, I should say that. Um, I'm not a software engineer um, by a long shot. Um, I have an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering, so I at least have some sympathy for the engineers. But, um, but I'm a scientist. And so um, my intent is to just try to give you something helpful um, for, to help you plan your simulations and um, kind of see in advance what you're going to do and target your simulations appropriately for, your, uh, for the machine that you'll be using. Um, and so I'll just give um, basically some ideas from the way I do this um, and the way I've done it for, um, for large scale simulations. Um, it is really important, I think, to plan simulations, especially for the large machines, of course, because they're very expensive. Um, and so we're doing, in extreme scale computing, we're doing very high stakes computations. Um, and so a lot of preparation should go into it. Um, and so we have to be careful um, to plan well in advance. Um, but um, as any plans, as we heard, I think, said yesterday, um, plans aren't meant to be um, necessarily followed. Um, plans are what you do so that when everything goes wrong, you, you can actually handle what goes wrong. Um, and so I'll say a little, bit about, um, a little bit about that as well. That is, that your plan needs to be flexible. Um, um, so um, for the graduate students in the audience, um, um, I think um, I'll try to, to speak mostly to you. Um, but the idea here is that you know, someone has to run the simulation um, and, um, and make sure it is giving scientifically useful results. Um, and so um, a lot of the tools that we, I think, introduced this afternoon, which I'll try to kind of give motivation for, um, and um, the, the talks this afternoon will give much better introduction to actually useful tools for like process management and, or workflow management um, and um, recording the state of the system you're running in. Um, but I'll try to give motivation. Um, if you're the person that's you know, on submitting jobs to the cluster um, or the computer um, to try and get your science done, um, everyone else has gone home, and you have to submit the job that will actually produce the science results. Um, so that's what this is. This is hopefully to help you out a little bit. OK. So uh, I'm going to basically give this in, in sort of two pieces. I'm going to start with planning, planning and budgeting simulations. So this is about um, how do I quantify how much my simulation is going to cost, um, and, and then how do I actually map that into something I can um, use to plan jobs with. Both, um, this isn't just for the proposal phase, right? So this is when you're trying to decide how you're going to propose, how you're going to actually turn your science goals into numbers that you're going to put in, a, put in as how much computing time you want. But also, uh, once you are actually have to execute your, um, your simulations and something funny happens, how do you retarget? How do you um, change your plan so that you can um, effectively, um, so that you can actually uh, accomplish your science goals, um, um, trying to be flexible so that you can actually get that done. Um, so that'll be sort of the first part. Um, and the second part, uh, I'll just kind of go through a lot of um, background kind of infrastructure, things that you want to have on hand when you're planning your campaign. Like I said, um, I kind of want to give this as just a motivational for the more sort of technical solutions that will be discussed probably this afternoon. So first, I want to give a little background from for perspective, so you know a little bit where I'm coming from, um, which is that I do um, simulations of thermonuclear supernovae. Um, and so this is, uh, so, these are sometimes called white dwarf supernovae. So basically it's the explosion of a compact star. Um, so this, this picture, so this is sort of the demonstrative, I'll show a movie in just a moment. Um, basically we have a star which was the blue thing, um, and the star blows up, right? So I get to blow up stars, it's kind of fun. Um, the star here that I'm dealing with is a star that's about the size of the Earth. 
Right? So it's not as big as the sun. It's something like what the sun will become at the end of its life when it's used up all of its fuel. Um, it'll leave behind a white dwarf star, which is kind of the size of the Earth, um, but still a sol of order of solar mass. Some of these kinds of white dwarfs um, can gain enough mass so that they actually will explode. Um, they explode because if you add mass to them, um, eventually they want to turn back into a star. That is, their central um, density and temperatures become high enough that they want to start fusing material again. Um, the problem is, getting from being a compact star to a non-compact star the size of the sun um, doesn't happen in a, ends up happening in a violent way. And so they end up exploding instead, basically. Um, basically what happens is um, um, there's some um, burning that starts in the center that converts the carbon and oxygen, which is what this star is made out of, converts it to iron group material in a short time scale. Um, and basically, this star gets incinerated by some combination of a subsonic burning front, so a slowly moving burning front, which will uh, maybe transition into a fast moving burning front, which will burn the star to, um, um, to iron group material. So the way this works here, let me just explain what the colors on this plot are, basically. Um, so this, this, this lower is sort of a cutout of one of these simulations. The blue is the surface of the star, kind of like the surface up there. This is kind of after a big piece of the simulation has ta taken place. Um, here, like I said, this is cutaway. The black stuff is the products of the burning. So in this case, um, the black is the iron group material. Actually, the green um, is stuff that's not processed as far. It's silicon group material. So if you start with carbon oxygen, first you make silicon group material and then iron group material. So um, the energy deposition has to track this transition among the different um, um, types of material. So we start, the, the red stuff is, is the surface, is the reaction front. So that's the surface in the star that separates fuel from, from ash or fuel from products, reactants from products. Um, and so this propagates through the star, um, initially subsonically. So this is the, the structure, this wrinkled structure um, is the subsonic propagation of this front. Um, it's uh, strongly affected by turbulence. And so one of the reasons that we need to do um, essentially high performance computations is because we want to capture the turbulent, how the turbulence accelerates um, the reaction process. It wrinkles this reaction front causes there to be more surface area, and therefore accelerates the burning. And so um, if you know anything about turbulence, you know that you need a contrast in length scales in order to get a turbulence cascade that looks um, somewhat like reality. Um, it's really actually very hard to get a real full turbulence cascade. Um, it requires a pretty good um, uh, factor of more than 100 um, contrast in scales. Um, and so that's a scale between where the flow is driven on because of the buoyancy of these, um, of, the, of the ash, the hot ash is buoyant. And so that'll drive um, fluid motion. So there's some larger scale on which that's driven and then it cascades down to small scales through a Kolmogorov cascade um, and that's our turbulence. Um, and so we wanna be able to contain both those scales, the large scale where it's driven and the small scale and, a, and at least a factor of 100, ideally below that scale where we think our dissipation, dissipation is therefore not too different from the reality of dissipation. And then we try to measure the turbulence and then understand how that enhances the, the reaction. Okay, so that's sort of the intro to my simulation. Um, like I said, it's a reactive compressible fluid dynamic simulation. Okay, so, um, how is this important? Well, this is important. A lot of the iron group material in us, in the Earth, um, is actually made in this kind of supernova. There's two kinds of supernovae. Um, one is formed um, when a high mass star um, ends its life. The center of the star will collapse. Um, the energy from that collapse will actually eject the rest of the material from the star. That's the other kind of supernova. That's called a core collapse powered supernova. The kind of supernova I'm talking about for this exploding star is a thermonuclear powered supernova. So the energy source comes from thermonuclear reactions. Um, and then we end up seeing the products. The iron group material that's produced um, um, we are, is actually the dominant source of iron group material um, in the Earth. Um, my simulations use flash. Um, let me show this movie so I can then talk about it. 
I'll run this through a few times. So this is actually a, a, a 2D simulation, largely because it's easier to see. Um, a 2D simulation of a um, supernova. The blue lines are um, density contours in the star, right? And so they're every um, factors of 10 in density. So we have a very big contrast in density. Uh, they start, um, the, the, this density contour is 10 to the 9 grams per cubic centimeter. So it's a fairly compact star, fairly high density, where the density of water is about one gram per cubic centimeter. So this is a billion times more dense than water. Um, the, the central density of the sun also is about one to 10 um, grams per cubic centimeter. Um, so this is a much denser star. It's a much more compact star than the sun. So these are the density, so density contours go out, down by factors of 10. So this is basically the surface of the star right here, right, where the density, the edge of the star is where the density falls off in space. Um, so this is ignited near the center, right? So um, we only simulate the actually explosion part, um, or I've, uh, the simulations I'll show and discuss are the explosion part. Um, there's other simulations done for the earlier parts. Um, the materials produced here are, I'm just gonna call iron group um, for the purpose of this talk. Um, and this is produced from the unburned fuel, which is carbon and oxygen. But there's also some other material produced. So we start, um, at high densities, we just produce mainly iron group. So that's the first part of the simulation. You can see here there's lots of turbulence. So this is the turbulence I was talking about um, in the inner regions. Um, in these inner regions, that accelerates the burning at first. Um, eventually, for this scenario, there's not just one scenario for how these things explode. Generally, um, there's a few different ways you can put deflagrations, which is this um, slow burning phase, together with de uh, detonation, this supersonic burning phase. Uh, there's a few ways you can put them together to get a, get a uh, thermonuclear supernova. Um, and so that's the second stage. So this whole thing takes about um, a second and a half to two seconds, depending on exactly um, what combination of deflagration and detonation um, you put together. Um, and it produces something that looks like this. And this is what we see when a uh, supernova explodes, when this kind of supernova explodes in the sky or when we observe it in the sky. Um, basically, we can see these different layers as the light propagates out through um, this ejected material. We can see that the surface is unburned carbon and oxygen is on the outside. There's a layer of oxygen and silicon followed by a layer of mostly silicon group material. Um, um, and then followed in the most interior is iron group material. So we actually see this layered structure um, from the spectrum of observed supernova. And so we're trying to reproduce that structure um, with our simulation. And so let me just show it again. So again, so at, at the end, it's just expanding. So it starts with the deflagration phase, transitions to the detonation phase, um, and then into ejection. Um, and so basically, the entire star is destroyed. Um, in about a second and a half. Okay. Right. Okay. So that's my uh, working um, um, application or science application. Um, so now I'm going to start talking a little bit about budgeting. Um, and so one of the, the um, best ways to do, do simulation budgeting um, is to have what, what I would call a pilot simulation or a surrogate simulation. Um, that is something that's the same physical problem, but either 2D instead of 3D or at lower resolution, um, so that you can do the simulation so you know what's going to happen. And therefore, you can budget for your full-scale simulation based on what happens in this pilot simulation. Um, and so I think this is pretty common. Usually, you know what you're going to do. Um, again, planning, right? Plans are made to be broken or whatever. Um, the idea here is you don't know exactly what's going to happen uh, when you get to large scale, um, but you try to anticipate as much as possible. Um, and so one example, so I'll just show a, a comparison example here between a 2D simulation of a slightly different supernova scenario um, um, called the, it's called the gravitational confined detonation scenario. But basically this is where instead of having the, this initial flame spread out through the whole star, um, it actually just goes out in one place on the, to the surface of the star. Um, we don't really know which, um, which is the right answer. So this is a 2D simulation, right? So this is in, um, this assumes azimuthal symmetry, right? So basically, um, basically you're simulating a pie slice, 
out of the star, right? So imagine a spherical star, you take a pie slice out of the star and you just simulate that pie slice. Um, in this visualization, unlike the previous one, I've actually mirrored the pie slice across, so it looks like a, a slice through a, a full simulation. So here, again, there's two phases. The deflagration, the first subsonic phase has the turbulence in it. Um, eventually this, this uh, material interacts on the other side and actually destroys the star with a detonation. Um, and so that's a 2D simulation. The nice thing about this is that we can tell where the burning is going to be, uh, the approximate extent and with time how, how much of the star the burned region will fill, and then how long it will be until the detonation occurs. Right? So those are the kind of the basic pieces of the, or stages of the simulation that we need to know in order to be able to budget um, how much computational um, power, how, much, how many compute cycles we actually need to perform the simulation. Right, and so then this is a 3D simulation. So it's not too different, but it is a little different, right? So now we have, we'll have real 3D turbulence, um, and so there'll be asymmetry around um, this, this basically rising hot spot, this rising bubble. Um, it'll go out through the surface, um, and then move around the surface of the star, much like the previous, uh, much like in the 2D simulation. Um, but um, the most important thing was to know where, like I say, how much space was filled um, by this, um, by the burn material. Because that's where, um, basically the surface of the burn material is where we have to concentrate our resolution. So flash is an adaptive mesh simulation, and so the mesh is non-uniform in space. Some regions of space have a very um, fine-grained mesh. Other places, like outside the star, for example, uh, the mesh is basically coarsened, very, very, very coarsened, because there's just, there's no material out there. So we have very coarse mesh cells. Um, out away from the simulation. But we need to know where the border is. We need to know how much it's going to cost, how many cells we're going to need to do this simulation um, before we start so that we can actually budget how we're going to put this, how we're going to put the simulation on the machine, how much time we need, how many simulations we can do for a particular amount of compute time. Right. So like I said, the best thing is to have a pilot simulation or a lower resolution 3D simulation. Say for this, often if we can do it at low resolution, but it's not right. We know it's not right for particular reasons having to do with the turbulence cascade, but it will give us an idea how fast the star will expand. So how much space the star fills, so we can budget how many cells we need, how many, um, what the computational cost is. Okay, so one of the things you really need to understand, both for budgeting simulations and especially for executing simulations, is how your scaling, how your code scales, right? And so I'm going to probably present. I think I'll present this a little bit differently from how it's usually discussed. Um, I'll basically present this the way I use it in practice, um, but the terms are the same. So um, the two important things are weak scaling and strong scaling. So for weak scaling, just to define these things, weak scaling is that. Um, you can do a larger problem on a larger machine, right? Often, if you're running on a machine of order the size of these large machines, this is kind of true, right? You've, your predecessors have worked really hard to make a software, piece of software that can actually weak scale. You can do a big problem on a big machine, right? Um, and so that's weak, that's weak scaling. Strong scaling is much harder, right? So strong scaling would be nice if we could actually do it. If you could take something that would run on your laptop and just you know, throw it on a gigantic machine and it run a million times faster, that doesn't happen. Um, that's the, that would be taking the same problem, the same simulation, um, low resolution simulation, say, um, and running on a large, large machine um, without, without it slowing down in some sense. Um, and so generally, that's where our limitation comes in. Um, so, but let me step back a little bit before I get too, that's, that, those are kind of really abstract, so I want to be a little bit more concrete. Um, and so let me step back. So the first thing we need to do um, is figure out a unit of work for our code, right? So that means like, well, if I'm going to talk about how well things scale, whether things speed up or slow down, well, I'd, first I need to, well, what, what is the thing that speeds up or slow downs, right? Um, once I know what a unit of work is, then I can quantify how that changes with scale, um, and I, then I can use it for budgeting. So I'm going to give an example from what I'm familiar with, which is Flash, um, or more generally, a domain decomposed fluid simulation. Right. So this is um, the way we parallelize our problem is to take some region of space and cut it up into smaller pieces. Right. And then we'll farm out the smaller pieces 
to um, different computational units, right? And so um, Anshu has kind of um, given me a little help introducing what is a block, right? So a block is one of these little squares um, or one of these big squares, right? Basically a block is something that has um, um, some number of spatial cells. In some regions it's very coarse, so it covers a lot of space. In other regions it's the, the mesh, the, the cells are very fine. Um, and so that they, it does, the overall block doesn't cover very much space, but you have good resolution in that area, right? And so the nice thing is that each of these blocks, all of these squares have the same number of cells in them. Generally something like 16 cubed or eight cubed or um, that choice can be made based on computational efficiency. Um, so this, is, this turns out to be a good work unit for a domain decomposed compressible fluid coat, right? Why? Um, basically because the way the solution happens is you start with this decomposed domain and then you step everything forward one step at a time through time, right? And so you can say, well, the unit of work here is what, what I'll call a block step, which is you take a block and you step it forward one time step, right? And basically that's our unit of work. Um, why don't I, you could ask, why don't I use a cell step, right? That's the real unit of work, right? Is that if you take one cell and you step it forward in time, that's the unit, you know, that's a real unit of work. Why don't I use that? Well, the reason, one reason is um, the numbers are kind of more ridiculous <laughs> when that happens. The other is um, really though that the, from the standpoint of the, of the software, um, you don't really take a cell step, right? A st doing one cell at a time would be very slow. The optimization is such that um, you really have to do some group of cells at a time for the, for the, for the work to actually, um, for the, or sorry, for the, for the work to optimize properly on the machine. And so it's easier to just talk about block steps because you'll never do an actual cell step. Your, your sim the simulation is really not that fine grained, um, even though that's the kind of fundamental um, thing that's going on. Okay, so that's my um, unit of work is a block step. Um, so what are the features? What is useful about this unit of work? Um, so, like I say, it's a larger version of the sort of fundamental thing, which is that I have a whole bunch of cells that I'm stepping through time. Um, the nice thing, one of the nice things is it's just a time, right? I can just say, well, a block step, in order to process a block through a step, it takes 200 milliseconds, right? It's just a number. Um, it's pretty easy to deal with. You can measure it on different machines. Um, you can keep track of it, just write it down. It's not, it's not really complicated. It's relatively simple um, to keep track of. Um, one sort of the, the real thing that I think is going on here um, is that the weak, the weak scaling is basically built in here, right? Which is that um, for, any, for some problem size, which is some number of blocks, right? That's how, much, how many cells I have filling space in my fluid simulation. And the number of steps I want to take, which is how long that simulation is going to run divided by the time step. Um, I can compute the execution time, how many CPRs this is going to take. That's not wall clock time. How many CPRs this is going to take. Um, is basically like this, the number of blocks times the number of steps times how long it takes to compute a block step, right? Um, and so this is really the necessary property that you want for your work unit, is you want your work unit to be something, it's the, something where you can express your simulation cost in terms of the work unit in some simple way, in some simple scaling form like this, right? And so that's what you want for your work unit. So, I'm going to ask a question for you guys that I don't know the answer to. Maybe this is a no-no for a talk. I don't know. Um, so what, what is the work that I'm talking about fluid simulations, but what is the work unit for you, your application? Um, you guys are seeing there's a lot of experienced people here, so you've probably had to deal with this. So I want to ask, does anybody have a different kind of simulation where they're, but, and, and have a good idea what your work unit is? Thank you. Um, so from, from my point of view, uh, I'm using a particle in cell code, so mm -hmm. we are mainly yeah. dealing with particles. In this case, usually the particles, uh, the, the engine for the particles is the most costly part of, uh, of the whole algorithm. And we can say that one particle, the time for, for one particle to be computed during one time step is usually our working unit working. to estimate the, the cost of a large simulation. Good. So, the, so the, the cost of compute a particle, so is it a time step for the particle? Usually we, we consider, the, for instance, we will calculate, we determine the time that, we, that one particle will need 
to, to be pushed during, to be during one time step. During one time step. And then we can extrapolate to a okay. certain number of time steps, yeah. time steps for a big simulation right. for a certain number of particles. Good. Yeah. So that's an example for a particle simulation, uh, particle and cell simulation. So that's good. So that's, it has this scaling property, which is that you can use it, you know, how much it costs to compute that unit, you can use it then to scale up to a full simulation, um, to any size simulation. Um, so in other words, my, I was interested, does anybody do molecular dynamic simulations? What do you do for molecular dynamic simulations? Yeah, so for an MD simulation, what do you use as your sort of unit of work that you can use to then scale, figure out how big the simulation is overall? Um, just cost per time step per set per grid point. So is it so so it's spatially? Is it a spatial grid? Yeah, it's a spatial yeah. grid. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so you have well-defined time steps that you can just do the same. Okay. So that's pretty similar. Okay. So also this is so so that's you're not on the hot plate anymore. It's okay. <laughs> I look a little nervous, but um, the. It doesn't have to be perfect, right? So even in Flash, when I say, oh well, you know. The, that it takes you know, 200 milliseconds to compute a block step. Um, it turns out that um, depending on what kind of energy deposition you have, if your, your energy deposition may not take the same amount of time to compute, depending on whether there's a lot of reactions going on or not. Um, and so sometimes this doesn't work really well. Or sometimes you have to do some work on your simulation in order to try to make this more true, um, to make your simulation more manageable. Um, and so um, this isn't a perfect thing, it's just you know, something to try to hold on to so that you can scale your stuff. Um, you know, when something happens and you have to decide what you're going to submit tonight because you need to get it back in the queue, um, you can do something really quick to figure out, well, okay, this cost is reasonable, this will actually run at least not, at least within a factor of two of the amount of compute time I want to budget for this simulation, right? That's the idea. Okay, so now I go to strong scaling. So I talked about, so weak scaling is kind of built in here, right? As long as this, you know, the, t the cost to compute your work unit is independent of, um, well, is, is just a number, right? That means you're, you're weak scaling. You can just scale your problem up in terms of CPU hours um, um, to, to a large load, right? So, so nominally, this is at large load. So I'm going to talk in terms of load instead of in terms of simulation size, right? So imagine I take my simulation, I'm going to divide it over some number of processors or some number of um, processing units. So when I say processor, I mean, you know, maybe it's nodes instead of processors, maybe it's um, GPU units or something like whatever you need to divide it above or divide it among. Um, so strong tailing is um, ideally the size of the cluster doesn't matter. So for any amount of load, Right? So I can put as, as, as much or as little on each processor as, pos as I want, um, and it doesn't matter. This TB, this time to compute a work unit, um, will be the same. That would be great if it were true, uh, but it's not. <laughs> right? When we get to really large, um, if you take a simulation, let's say it this way, if you take a simulation, you spread it over more and more processors, what happens is the load per processor goes down. Right? Um, and the time to compute your work unit generally goes up at some point. Um, in some range, it'll hopefully be flat, right? That is that you'll be able to um, compute on a similar, t your work unit can be computed on a similar time to if you could put it all on one machine um, or a, you know, one node or something. But not only at some point, you're gonna, your load per, per, per processor is going to get low enough that um, this is going to start to go up. And so that's where you're, basically your strong scaling is breaking. Your load has gotten low enough that you can't, that you're actually, your in inefficiency is becoming, a pro becoming an issue and it's slowing, um, your, slowing down your ability to compute your work unit, right? And so that's the, at the low end here, right? So the, here, this is maybe counterintuitive. The low end here is the large scale, right? Is spreading a computation over um, a large number of processors. Um, generally, you also have a maximum load, right? Generally, you can't put your whole simulation on one processor, even if you wanted to, right? Processors have finite memory, um, and so the, the, some maximum load is how much load you can actually put, just fit in the memory of one node. Um, and so you're going to have some, what I'm going to call margin here, some flexibility margin between the maximum load that you can put on it pro per processor. Right? That's basically the smallest job you can run without overflowing the memory on a node. 
and the largest job you can run, how, how diluted you can um, spread out your, your work um, without basically breaking your scaling. Right? And so that's the margin that you want to target when you're planning a simulation. You want to target your load so it's between your maximum load and your minimum load um, for scaling. Right? And so this is really um, what you have to do to plan simulations, to keep them in this scaling regime so that you're not losing efficiency. Um, and so it's nice to have a code that has a big flexibility region. Right? Um, every application is going to have different. If this is only a factor of two, um, it can be tricky to, to schedule your simulations properly, to plan how you're going to execute your, your campaign. Um, because you can only, if you only have a factor of two, if your simulation grows, grows from here to there, then you have to move it to more processors. Right? So it can be tricky. So you want as much flexibility as you can get. Um, but that's just largely you don't, often you don't have control of that. That's just um, how your application will scale. OK, so now that you have a work unit, we have an idea of how we can target or, or what, what we need to do in order to plan our simulations. And we have your work unit. You know the cost of your work unit. You have to evaluate the cost of your work unit at different scales for different loads um, on different machines. It's going to be different. On di Every time you come to a new machine, you'll have to redo that all over again, right? Because different machines have different characteristics. OK, so but then um, we want to budget our simulations or plan our simulation campaign. So as I just said, we want to target between the load margins. We want to sit in that regime where our, where um, our simulation scales, where our computation will actually get done efficiently. We're actually using the computer um, effectively. Um, but we also have to meet our science goals, right, um, in some specific metric. And so this is especially important when you're proposing. Um, you want to propose your science goals in terms of some specific metric, like, um, so I mentioned scale contrast for turbulence, right? If, you know, if I know what the approximate um, driving scale is, and then I know that I need to get down to, you say, a factor of 100 below the driving scale, um, that's a metric. And I can say what resolution I need to, to reach in order to, for that to ha be true, how long I have to have that resolution for, like when is that critical in my um, energy deposition. Um, and then I can use that um, as a metric to place my science goals and measure the size of the simulations that I need. Right? and then measure the cost based on the metrics that I just introduced. Um, so that's for turbulence. Um, other simulations, you might need to resolve particular gradients for, um, for particular such, um, over particular regions. Um, and so again, um, those are your science goal metrics. And you have to translate those somehow um, then into um, computational cost. Um, the other thing you will probably, we don't usually run one big simulation nowadays, thankfully, because the computers are big enough um, you often want to cover your parameter space a little bit. You don't want just one value. You want, say, five values of some parameter. Um, and so you want to cover your parameter space um, as well. So those are your science goals that you then have to map into something that fits between your load margins and can be accomplished on the queues that are available on the machine. OK, so um, touching on something that was mentioned last night is um, <laughs> what you might want to do, generally you should do, um, is budget in for resolution study, right? So you're not going to have to do a resolution study for every value of your parameter space usually, but it's generally a good idea at least to budget for maybe the ends of your parameter space or at least one thing among similar parameters. Um, and so that's something you want to include, right? You want to say that even in your proposal, like we will do one simulation at this resolution that will do a resolution study and then we'll use it to, to support, right? Nobody's going to be able to redo, reproduce your highest maybe resolution simulations of, at all your parameters, but you'll have, you, you have the data to support, well, we were able to do it at, one, at you know, one value of our parameter space, and everything looked OK under, these metri under such and such metrics. Right? Um, keep in mind that you know, most multidimensional methods assume that you are doing this. Right? The method doesn't actually work unless you also do a resolution study. Right? Um, nobody would do uh, you know, a simple 1D time integration without doing the adaptive time stepping, right? Just ignore right, the uncertainty due to that uh, and not adapt your time step. Well, that's what you have to do here. In order to measure your uncertainty in your computation, 
Um, the assumption is that you'll do the simulation at, or the calculation at different resolutions to evaluate the uncertainty in your um, calculation. That's typically built in and assumed that you're doing that. So just budget for it, right? Um, often it's not, you know, it, depending on this application, it may not be a dominant um, part of your budget um, if you're covering a lot of parameter space. Okay, so that was part one. Um, part two will be a bit quicker. Um, that was that was just that was really my view on how to um, effectively plan for simulations. And so now I'm just going to try to give some ideas of um, what are important things you need to have kind of on the table when you're starting your campaign. Okay. So, um, right. And so these are really infrastructure suggestions, sort of things I found useful. Again, I'm not going to touch on any particular tools. I'm a scientist, not an engineer, um, and so I'll leave the the engineering to the engineers, um, but I'm going to try to motivate why you're going to want these things as a scientist. Um, and sort of the things that you need to keep track of in your head to make sure that whatever nice engineering platform is actually accomplishing those goals for you, right? You don't want to use, as, as we've heard, you don't want to use something that's nice and technical and pretty and then it doesn't accomplish the, the science or the um, technical goal that you wanted, that it <laughs> was supposed to be accomplishing for you. Okay, so first, regression testing. So we've heard a little bit about regression testing um, in terms of code revision, right? That you want to um, always have, you know, have lots of tests that test every, um, um, every little piece of your code. Um, so it would be nice if we could take that nice tested code and then run our simulation campaign with it. That, at least in astrophysics, that hardly ever happens. Um, we always end up needing to make some change. Either, even the simplest change, say, um, the way we were doing the mesh refinement to find the regions where we needed to find mesh, uh, maybe it didn't actually work out. Maybe it seemed to work in 2D, but then we get to the full 3D simulations and it wasn't quite sufficient. Or we need to trim it better in order to optimize our simulation volume. Um, well, that's going to require a code change. And that code change is going to need to be validated or verified to make sure that it's okay. And so you need regression testing in place ahead of time. Um, if you're using a big application like Flash or um, some other um, um, supported application, um, oftentimes there's already regression tests for all the components in the, in, in the simulation. What you need is regression tests for your scientific application, right? your specific problem setup. So that if you do a simulation, and then somebody makes some changes to fix something, right? Even some I.O. issue. Say there's some I.O. issue on that platform. Well, an engineer comes in and fixes it. You have to, right? You're the scientist. They're going to look at you and say, is it still working? And you have to answer. You have to say yes or no, right? Yes, my, the application is still working. I can still run my next simulation or no. Something is wrong, right? So you need regression tests not for the base layer, right? But for your specific problem setup, your specific um, science problem, so that you know that it is still working, that you can say they can go work on something else, um, and you can continue with your your science campaign. Um, so one of my suggestions for this is to make sure you split your science problem into separate stages. Oftentimes we have something that starts from zero, right, the initial part of the simulation, but there may be some much more complex part of the simulation later on, you have to test that part too, right? So you wanna have, say, a checkpoint that you restart from later in the simulation that has everything, everything is going on and everything is, is happening. Um, that's what you wanna check because that's where, where it's most you know, loaded, most critical, is when things tend to break. So, um, so you want to make sure you have several stages that cover the different epochs of your science simulation um, so that you can run them and say, yes, everything's working. Um, so you might want to also, a good thing to do is include performance testing. Obviously, this, often this isn't really hard. It's just write down the number for how fast that thing ran, right? Or just check it. Just look. Make sure you know, have a checklist. And one of the things you check is to, to make sure it hasn't slowed down. Right? If they make some I.O. change that supposedly sped everything up and made it all work, but it didn't, that's a problem. Right? You have to know that. Um, you have to know that as a scientist. The, the person actually doing the science simulation, um, you're the boots on the ground. You have to know whether it's going to be a problem um, because they're going to go home. 
and you're going to be left to make it work. So um, <clears throat> my suggestion would be to have both automated tests. A lot of times, the sh these short tests, we put a lot of emphasis on short tests that can be done quickly. Often, that's not doesn't work so well for sci big science simulations. Um, you need short tests, automated tests, but you also need longer tests that are driven by your science goals that really address the, the science question or the science result is still uh, is still good. Um, and so those tests may take a, a fair amount of computer time, not a lot of computer time, but they may take you know a half hour. You know they may require actually a bit a, a job submission to really um, tell that it's still working for this longer test, right? And you should have those planned out in advance so that you know what's, what you're going to need. Say the first time you run through some piece of first parameter space you run, you know, keep, get those things set up, figure out where you want them so that if anything changes, you can actually um, just check um, and then continue on to accomplish your science goals. OK, so job management. So um, generally, um, we have to work with the machine. Um, so simulations warn you're not just going to submit your job to the machine, go home and sleep, you know, take a vacation for two weeks and then come back. Um, really, simulations run over many job submissions, right? So a long simulation, it's a simulation campaign. It's not just one simulation. Even for one parameter combination, generally, you're still going to go through lots of job submissions. Um, and so um, my advice for this, at least from running on the machines, um, some other different machines may be different. Um, but at Argon, um, what we did was to select a partition size. So machines now tend to seem to be moving a lot more towards defined partition sizes, just for architectural reasons. Um, and then you want to chain jobs with dependency, right? So you have to share the machine with other people. The easiest way to do that is to allow people to swap in and out, right? So you run for eight hours, and someone else can run for eight hours. Um, but if they're not ready to run, right, or um, if you have more to run, it's extra information if you can provide a sequence of jobs that you think will just run um, and then have them be dependent on each other. Right? So this allows the scheduler, whether that scheduler is a person or an, al an algorithm, it allows the scheduler to make better decisions about how to schedule the machine. Right? If you've got a set of jobs, you know, you know, five, five jobs that will complete your simulation, um, and they're queued up and, and um, um, have their dependencies defined, um, that, it's good to know that. The, if the scheduler knows that, it can make better decisions about how um, the overall machine is scheduled. Um, and so um, I encourage you to do that. This does mean you have to have some infrastructure things. You have to have queue scripts that check status and will, will fail out um, or, and set the, the jobs up themselves, right? So this requires a little bit of infrastructure work on the scripting side, or on the queue script side. Um, and so you you know you want to you don't want to spend time if the previous leg of the simulation was bad, um, but you do want to um, be able to continue pick up and continue if it was if it was okay, um, and you get your partition back. Um, okay, um, use your load margins. So the thing I introduced before, one of the most useful things about the using load and load margins um, is you can use that to target your partition size, and as your simulation changes size, use it to change the uh, to retarget your partition size. Um, and so um, having a stable job size might actually be worth a little bit of science planning, right, in terms of your mesh, your, if, you're, if you can have some control over how your refinement pattern of your mesh happens uh, or what resolutions you're using. Um, um, you might actually plan a little bit of your science to get yourself a more stable job size because you'll be able to execute your, um, your campaign more effectively. OK, so another thing to have online um, is in the, in the um, discussion of, of workflow um, is you really want to monitor your run health, right? So you and you, if you're the grad student that's running the simulation, this will be you. They will look at you and say, is everything OK, right? Um, so you want run health monitoring. Um, and this is especially existential as, as extreme scales. Everything's expensive, like one job. Anomaly is really expensive. A lot of CPU, um, a lot of money was spent on that, on the power and the, um, the hardware that actually executes that, even one job. Um, and so the stakes are high. And so you want to make sure that everything is OK at every level. Also, general, generally, the scientist is the most interested. The scientist is the one who wants you know, every, you know, every plot coming off the machine every day, making sure it's OK. Right? And so that's what you want. You're the person. Um, the scientists who make sure that everything's okay. 
Okay, so what do you include, right? So you want some summary variables, right? Some, um, the cl you want something as close to your science results as possible. Sometimes it's hard to do that, um, but if you can get something close, it's good. Um, so as close to your science outcomes um, and more things. Another useful thing to have is a cumulative cost function. So if you have this, you have in block steps, how many block steps have we computed? How much is it costing per block step, right? Um, so those things you can use to monitor performance. Like is something going wrong? Has it suddenly slowed down for some reason? You really need to know that. Um, and it's also helpful to know how much. It's not like, hmm, it didn't run as far as I expected it to. But did it really? How many block steps did it use? Is it slowing down just because it's getting big? Or is it slowing down because something's wrong and it's, and it's not computing your work unit as fast as it's supposed to be, right? That you need, and then you need, to, you need to stop and address that. Um, snapshots and slices in movies, this kind of stuff is really useful um, for just telling if everything is OK, right? Um, so they can be low cost, right? Just a slice. Just something that's useful that tells you that nothing's too terribly wrong. Um, you know, so simple scripted visualizations are best. Um, so one thing I would say about this is simplicity is, go is, is OK, right? You, need, you should start from something to understand, something that you can use that's not too complex. And then if you have some more, if you have some infrastructure you can tie into, that's great, right? But the minimum you need is you know, some scripts that generate some things that you can look at after every run. So I'm going to give. I'm just going to show a, a quick example that I use for. So this is for um, supernova simulations. Um, so yeah, that's maybe a little interesting. So I mean, nominally these are just you know um, burn mass as a function of time. So it starts with not much. You don't need to see the numbers. Um, starts with not much and then it goes up and burns the whole star, right? That's all this is. And these are in different, so this is in, um, some of them are like full total burn mass and some of them are like burn mass in um, iron group material, right? So there's a couple of different metrics that are useful. Um, and again, this is just a web page generated by a script. Um, and so then there's a, this works. So these are just slices, much like before, but this is in 3D. This is the 3D simulation. Um, so the black stuff is the um, burned material, and it goes through this and out to the detonation, right? And so these are basically X, Y, Z, or perpendicular X, Y, Z slices, right? So just, right, those are pretty quick to compute, right? It doesn't take too long to do this visualization, um, but it's, it's not a full visualization. It's just enough that you can tell that the run is working. There's nothing wrong. There hasn't been like an extra detonation that wasn't supposed to be there. That happened. Um, that you know that the the star is expanding the way you expect. It's not running off the grid, or it's the size that you want it to be. You know that kind of thing. You could add metrics here. You could add things here about resolution, uh, whatever you need, sort of to monitor your, the health of your simulation. Right. And so what you do is you add each time you run a, p a job a little leg of the simulation, you add a few frames to this movie. So you just keep all the frames and then just remake the movie every time you add a few frames, right? And so that's the idea, is that then you can just look at this and say, okay, everything looks okay. Like there's no problems. Or if there's a problem, you can go back and look at the individual frame just to try to figure out what's going on, right? So this is really important at large scale, especially for you who's the person, if you're the person who's doing the science, right? They're gonna, uh, you know, you need to know whether the simulation is working properly. Okay, so you can also include other things. Uh, whatever's important for you. Boundary condition behavior, sometimes that's important. We've had problems with the boundaries before. If so, put in a simple visualization that just checks the boundary so you can see that nothing bad is happening. All right, conservation metrics, whatever you need. Um, also, comparisons to pilot runs are very useful. On uh, the plots I just showed, one of the lines was actually um, basically a sort of standard run that I kind of understand. I looked, I've looked, I looked through that run to make sure I knew what was going on. And so then I put its, its um, plot on the summary plots, you know, whatever versus time, so that I could compare, right? And so that just allows you to make sure everything's okay, right? Quick checks, you know, while sort of online analysis, um, the quick versions. Okay, so just a couple more things. Um, helps to have someone co-pilot. Right, this is, it's not like we don't, people don't know this. The reason there's two pilots in a plane is that, you know, one, if one of them gets, you know, has some health problem, the other one can take over. But uh, much more effective is that um, humans are much, do a much better job when they work together. 
if it's you and another person, two humans do a much better job, um, much better job if they cross-check each other. And so that's what the pilot and the co-pilot do. Well, if you're spending a whole lot of time, a whole lot of money on a simulation, you can get someone to just look over your parameter files, look over your inputs, just check, make sure everything's okay. Right, just to reduce, it makes you more conscientious because someone's gonna look over your shoulder um, and then it catches errors, right? It's just, a, it's just the way humans are. Okay, so another thing is recording versioning. So there'll be a lot, a much better talk about this this afternoon, I believe, um, about um, provenance, is that the one's called? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so that's, that's good. So you should do that, but at least you should keep track of what version you ran your simulation with, right? So just the simple. So simple can go a long way. At least you know what you use to run the simulation, all right? Um, but discipline is essential, right? So you have to, every time, write down, even if it's late at night and you're putting in the simulation, don't wait till tomorrow morning, like write something down. Write down what you know about what you're submitting, right? So it's like keeping a lab book, right? That you're, you know, as an undergrad, they beat you over the head, right? You have to write everything down you can in your lab book, right? And so this is an essential activity. This is where our, where it's really computational experimentation, right? We need to write down what we're doing and record carefully what we're doing. Um, choose a way to version control. So, you know, there's several different ways to version control, <coughs> including just keeping every copy of your code. Um, but <clears throat> maybe choose something better than that. But choose something you understand, right? Don't choose this time to move to your new, to a new version control system, right? You know, choose something that you know um, how it works and you're not going to get lost late at night when you need to figure out why something isn't working. Um, <clears throat> use project branches. So this is my, my suggestion. Um, SVN, get branching is not too, is, is pretty easy. So use a, a project branch um, for your specific campaign, whatever you're doing right now, right? Because this reduces the barrier to commits, right? You can say, okay, I just something. Well, I'll just commit it. It's okay. It's not gonna break anybody else's stuff. It's just, you know, in my project branch, but it then at least I know what's going on, right? It's recorded, right? And then you can worry about integration later. Um, sometimes you end up with a bunch of um, random branches, but that's better than not knowing what you ran, right? It's better to end up in the situation where you have a bunch of branches than you don't know what you ran. Um, and so you want a low barrier to commit, right? Never run something that's not committed. Well, try not to. <laughs> um, Write down what you did. You know, what did I run this with? Um, any, you know, if you use more than one package, just write down the version of each package that you use. Right? Just, just simple is better than nothing. Um, and put this in a standard place. Right? Every run should have some file that's sitting there, name the same thing. Um, also, if you have to have submission parameters that are on the command line, make sure you write those down. Right? Like, write, make a submission script. Right? You should never be typing in some big long command line to submit your job, because you're gonna forget all that stuff, right? Write it down, put it in a script, something. Um, um, generally for big runs, the advice from us working at the Flash Center is don't, re don't reuse your run directories. Um, maybe this is obvious. Um, that's okay for cheap runs, like 2D runs, um, but for big runs, uh, it can make things very complicated. <laughs> so separate run directories. Every job submission is a separate directory. Um, and then figure it out later. You can just symbolic link stuff. It's not that bad. Yeah, right at the, just about at the end. So the last thing is to plan for the unplanned, right? So um, I mean this as, you know, save lots of checkpoints, right? Checkpoint your jobs frequently because sometimes things will go wrong and the queue will break and, or, you know, the machine will just have some problem. So you need to be able to restart. And you're gonna wanna checkpoint um, more frequently for large jobs because, of course, if you have a, a small job and you checkpoint at the end, well, the equivalent time to checkpoint in a larger job at the same amount of computing time is sooner, right? And so what you're trying to do by checkpointing is not repeat that part of the calculation, right? And you can, so you should balance your output time for checkpoints um, with the impact on simulation time. Don't overdo it. Um, but Output more checkpoints than you, you know, sort of strictly need, and then just delete them, right? That's, this is just um, good run practice, right? Um, so that you can restart if something happens to the queue, or something happens to the machine, something happens on the machine. Um, or in your code, right? Then you have to fix and restart. Right, and sometimes your visualization may need a higher cadence. 
Um, but that's a, just a side point. Okay, so that's it. Um, so I just split the, like I said, I split this into two things. So trying to budget your simulations with your work unit, um, understanding your work unit so that you can use it to target this, um, um, this um, load range, right, between your minimum load for scaling and your maximum load per, per processor that you can do. Um, and then, you know, just try to be ready for your simulation campaign. Um, do your homework um, um, and do what you, you know, keep track of everything. That's it. Thanks. Question. So where's your standard place for your run with notes? Is it in the run directory in a text file or in a yeah, text so I have a, yeah, yeah, so I have a file called run with <laughs> um, in, the, in, the, in the submission directory. So that's why I use one directory per job submission. And in, in, in every one of those, whether it's changed or not, um, I, there's a run with file that lists the versions for the things that were the like version of code that was used, and if there was more than one piece of something used, versions for both of the for all of them. So that's it's literally called run with. It's just a text file. Okay. So yeah. for sharing that information with collaborators or others on your team, do you just point them to? So f for me, in the in the situations I was running with, it was only a few people, right? It was a relatively small team, um, and so that was sufficient at that point. Um, certainly, you should do whatever is whatever works for your team. Um, if your team is used to it being in another place, another place is good. Um, but I mean, I, the, the important thing is to not get disassociated with the run. Um, but yeah, so maybe both. I mean, whatever. I mean, often it's very easy for the run directories to propagate it. As long as it doesn't change, you just copy it with your executables and everything, just copy it in, um, and then just update it. Um, and then, you know, you might process that in some other way. Okay. Oh, do you actually keep the executables in the run directory as well? I usually do because they're much smaller than the data and I never delete anything that's small. <laughs> but I, yeah. I, I may be a little bit of a pack rat in that sense. Because okay. so. it is often useful just to diff executables to make sure you didn't mess something up and you, you know, updated your executable and forgot to update your run with file. Uh, that happens. So it is useful to just keep the real stuff uh, for diffing purposes. Even though, you, you, I mean, you're not going to be able to run it on some other machine. but. So for the uh, visualization that you showed, can you describe a little bit what you do there? Do you have like a script that's taking data from your checkpoint files and yeah. dumping it into the plots? Or yeah, OK, let me, yeah, I can say a little bit. Okay, so I mean, nominally this is, yeah, so getting really technical. Um, so this is um, visit, um, but this is vis visit run in batch mode. It's not, inter it's not interactive. Um, so I just run visit in batch mode. So that'll generate one of these panes, right? So it places all the lines and whatever. So that generates just one of this, this square. Um, and then I put it together using whatever, PNM, PNM, PNM cat or whatever it is. PNM cat. So it's just something that'll cat, concatenate bitmaps. Um, that's PNM tools. I don't know. This is really. <laughs> Nitty gritty. Um, so PNM tools, you can just put. So it's basically three separate pictures um, that are then put together into one frame, right? And then there's just a bunch of frames, and then I just make a run um, movie maker over them when I add a frame, and then rerun the movie maker over it. So it's all done ex externally to visit. It's not inside visit. Um, visit just generates the single frames, um, and then everything else is done with a separate with separate commands. Does that answer your question? <laughs> and, and these are, like I said, these are slices. So it's just a slice, 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 um, just because that's what was cheap um, and easy to do. Yeah. I was wondering if you have any equivalent of work unit for the memory. So often we, when we scale, uh, it requires larger memory and also more go cells. So how do you uh, exp like predict that? Yeah, so usually the, where that shows up is that's what sets your, your maximum load, right? So here the maximum load is the amount of blocks. So, so yeah, the amount of blocks you can put on a processor, right? And so that usually is limited by memory. Um, and it's not always really obvious because machines act different ways um, for memory. Um, and so, um, yeah, so that's where the memory comes in. It's whatever your max load is, is generally due to your memory footprint. So maybe that helps. I have one follow-up that might be useful. 
Yeah. Can you give can you give the students a sense of you have a, you have an infrastructure right at this point about how the simulations ran? How long did that take to accumulate? Right, it was not one day you woke up and you had it. Right, so so there was a process to to get there. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, if I had to sit down, I mean, yeah. my stuff is not pretty. Um, it's these sort of nasty shell scripts and that run other shell scripts and the icky, icky stuff. Um, so, uh, you know, if I had to rewrite it from scratch, it, you know, it probably would take, I don't know, not very long, really. Like, you know, like a week, maybe. Um, the hardest things to are, okay, the hardest things are getting visit to make the thing that you want to make in batch mode. That's pretty tricky. Um, so that's tricky. Um, also, like clipping off, you have to clip off the high resolution stuff so that you only have the low resolution stuff. So that's pretty tricky. Um, the other thing that took a lot of time is writing your writing the scripts that do your. I can't get to the slide, but writing the scripts that actually check your old job. That can take a lot of testing, and so that's what takes time is testing it to make sure it actually checks for the right things. And behaves correctly and sets the new job up, and uh, you know all your and you catch all the random things that can happen. So I guess that's. I have a follow up to that follow up. Yeah. Okay. Is uh, it might be useful to give a feeling for the actual amount of time it takes you to prepare for a simulation, including your uh, measurements, your scaling, the pre-planning. The pre-planning. Um, well, I mean, in terms of wall clock time, <laughs> um, I mean. It can take quite some time. Yeah, in terms, it can, I mean, like the major simulations we ran at Flash, we would start to plan weeks ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, weeks or months, because often if if you need if you need something like you need a particular scaling metric, like you can't just do that. Like that's not easy to do. And so the the lead time you need is time to you know get you know get your visualization script to work the way you want. Get your you know, get a scaling metric, which may require five or 10 runs to do. Um, so, so it does take, you know, a month or two in advance of planning, of setting things out so that you know what you're going to do when, when you're ready to go.